isn't it? Wow. Well, um, I want to share a message with you this morning, then we'll end that with communion and a song of worship this morning. I think God's going to do powerful stuff. So this will be good for families, for everybody today, and, and I just want to share with you. How many love God's Word today? Come on, get a Bible in your hand. I'm going to lift mine up here. Let's get a Bible in our hand. Just honor God because... Uh, if you don't have, you know, a, a, a Bible, use your phone, your whatever you're reading Scripture on. Uh, that's the Bible, the Word of God, and just lift that up. And, and uh, man, I, I like that, don't you? I love God's Word. The psalmist said, uh, I found your Word, and I rejoiced like somebody who found a great treasure. Wow, so this is the greatest treasure you could ever find is the truth of God's Word. Amen? Amen. Well, turn to Romans chapter, Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read several verses. We'll say a prayer, and we're going to jump into this message that's going to lead us right into communion today. Right into really my favorite sacrament in the in the ordinance in the body of Christ, communion. I just think it's, it's beautiful. Romans chapter 10, verse 15 through 17. How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Father, thank, thank you for this scripture. Thank you for the, the word of God, the seed of his word. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the one we know as the author of Scripture and is also the author of Revelation in our hearts. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you from Scripture into our being to make the Word real, alive, and personal to every heart and every person listening today by the authority and power of Christ himself, in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? From this scripture, I'd like to share a message today, and, and to make it memorable, I thought this would be a great title because it's right in here, uh, How Beautiful Are the Feet. So I just want to talk to you about beautiful feet. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, the message is beautiful feet. So look down at your feet, why don't you? And have you ever thought of your feet as beautiful? Uh, <laughs> all right, there's places you can go to help your feet look good. And, uh, but <laughs> beautiful feet. Look at your neighbor and tell them, beautiful feet. <laughs> we're, we're, we're using Scripture here today. The Scripture is clear. How beautiful are the feet. And the reason it says feet, how beautiful are the feet, it's quoting the Old Testament. And this idea of how beautiful are the feet is, is when you hear someone coming, you know, often there are stories told about, I heard footsteps coming down the hall. You know, sometimes after life experiences, people will come back and go, I heard footsteps coming down the hallway, and then, and then Jesus stood at my bedside. Or uh, You just hear these, but the first thing usually they emphasize is footsteps came, right? And so this scripture says, how beautiful are the feet that come with a certain message. Uh, if you heard footsteps coming and you knew it was judgment or you knew it was something bad, you wouldn't look forward to that and go, man, beautiful feet coming down the hallway. But if you know that the message is right, if you know it's a good message, then you go, beautiful footsteps, beautiful feet 
deliver that message to my place. Beautiful feet. And that's what Paul is telling us in Romans chapter 10 as he quotes that Old Testament scripture, how beautiful are the feet that bring good news, that bring glad tidings of good things. And he specifically tells us what the message is. How beautiful are the feet who preach the gospel of peace. Our feet are beautiful. I think mine must be really beautiful. I was meditating on this message this morning, and I, I just, I, I, you know, I don't know if it was God talking to me or just my thoughts, and I, I'm not sure I really care. I, I, to me, it was God speaking to me. Because I thought to myself, if anybody's got beautiful feet, Stephen Schlebach's got beautiful feet. Because I've been preaching a message of peace for years and years and years. If anybody has, has preached the gospel of his grace and his goodness and, and what the finished work of Christ has done, I've done it, and I, I know I'm boasting a little bit, but I think I have beautiful feet. Because I think I brought the right message the best way I know how. I think I've represented the gospel pretty well. I just think I have really, really beautiful beautiful feet <laughs> because I'm a messenger of peace right you're a messenger of peace come on we're shining God's love in our community we're sharing it with people our feet are beautiful I mean when when people see the chaplain coming down Wendy's a chaplain at the hospital when they hear her footsteps coming down the hallway uh, her feet are beautiful because she comes with a message of peace. When you go into the community and you share with your neighbors, your feet are beautiful because you're carrying something the world is looking for. It's a message, a message of peace. My feet are beautiful because I'm a messenger of peace. Woo! Come on, look at your feet again. That is, I want it seared in your memory because tomorrow when you go to work, when you meet people, when you talk to people, I want your foot to remind you you're a beautiful messenger. You're a carrier of the gospel. Wow. And people don't go, oh, no, here he comes again. Hear your footsteps coming down the hall and go, oh, no. If we get the message right, people ought to be, hear your footsteps coming and go, beautiful footsteps. Weren't those missionaries last Sunday great? Those young people with a heart for the world, those four missionaries that shared here last Sunday, I, their feet must be beautiful, carrying the gospel of peace to the, to the nations. This gospel of peace. and So let's read further in Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This message, just so you know, I mean, if you've been around here a long time, you're like, well, he preaches this stuff all the time, and that's exactly what I do do. But uh, I'm preaching this today because it's Family Sunday, and I just want to remind us of these truths and enter us in to a powerful moment of communion because communion is the culmination of all of this. It speaks the truth, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Wow. Messengers of peace. Now, now, I want to clarify for you. The word peace literally means reconciliation. 
So the word peace, a messenger of peace, or the gospel or message of peace is not necessarily a message of tranquility, like we would think it's real peaceful. Hey, it produces peace, but what it actually means is, is that what divided us, what separated us from God has now been removed, and we have now been brought together. So the word peace translated in the English as peace, meant the, the message or the gospel of reconciliation or God and man being brought back together. Woo! And we are messengers of that, of that message. We're messengers of reconciliation. I mean, what kind of message do we have to give to the world? Our message is not straighten up and fly right and get it right. Our message is, did you know Jesus took your problem so you and God can get back together? Why don't you get back with God? He'll take care of the problems. I mean, come on, you can't have, as I preached a message Wednesday night, God is on board. I mean, if you're conscious of God on board, it'll take care of your sin problem. We don't really have to tell people, well, don't do, don't act like a Christian. Why don't we get them and God together? <laughs> what a message we have. Do you know that everything that separates you from God, Jesus took care of it. Why don't you get with God and let God get with you? This gospel, this thing, this message I want to bring to you is a message of peace. Look at me. I got beautiful feet. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1. In case you don't remember, I read there in Romans chapter 10 how beautiful are the feet of the person who preaches the gospel of peace. And then it, the next, the last verse I read there said, Who has believed our report? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I, I'm not sure why some of these English translations were so vague with some of these wordings, but uh, it literally means faith comes by hearing and hearing by the report of God. So faith comes when you hear the right report. It's not some, yeah, we love the word scripture. It produces faith. We, 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 we understand that, that scripture is faith producing. But the reason scripture is faith producing is because it brings us the truth. When you get the right report, faith can be released. And so in Romans 10, it says, not everybody has believed the report. And he's actually quoting from Isaiah chapter 53. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And then he jumps and quotes Isaiah 53. Not everybody has believed the report. What report? The report of reconciliation. So, so Isaiah 53 verse 1 says... You all probably know it, right? Who has believed the report of the Lord? Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then all of Isaiah 53, one of our favorite chapters in the Bible because it tells about the work of Christ, our suffering servant, we call it. And so it tells about our Savior, our Lord, Jesus, who came. And the rest of Isaiah 53 is the report that we're supposed to believe. And so it says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And I would love to read all of Isaiah 53 for you, but uh, I, I want to move the time along. So I'll just read a couple verses. But the, the whole chapter is filled with this report. Let me read verse 4 through 6 for you. Uh, if you're turning there, I'll give you just a moment so you can follow and, or follow on the screen here. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 6. Are you ready? This is the report. 
This, this, is, this, this is what produces faith. This is what people are supposed to believe. This is what makes your feet beautiful. Woo! Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace, not tranquility, the chastisement for our reconciliation was upon him. Come on, let's just worship him a moment. You just, you got to worship somebody like Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I, oh, wow. Thank, I stand in awe, the wonder of your grace. Thank you, Jesus. The chastisement for our reconciliation was upon him, and by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If you're not a missionary by now, you ought to be one today. <laughs> I mean, come on. Don't you want to be a missionary with beautiful feet to whoever God leads you to and calls you to, to tell them this report? Eh, everybody's turned against God. Everybody's got a problem. But let me tell you what God did. God brought you back to himself by laying your problem on Jesus, and he bore your iniquities. He was wounded. Everything that should happen to you happened to Jesus so you could be set free. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. So I, I, I'm preaching this from my notes and my knowledge and knowing what I want to get across this morning. So I, 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 I sometimes forget to tell you kind of where I'm going because Isaiah 53 is that report. And later today when you get a chance, you should read all of Isaiah 53. And then you should not stop there. You should finish in Isaiah chapter 54 because Isaiah 53 is the report. It's the gospel of peace. It's what happened. And then we get to Isaiah 54 and we have the result, which is the covenant of peace. So I want to talk to you and am talking to you about the gospel of peace. That's what Jesus did for us. And then we get to live in the covenant of peace, which is the result of the report. The report is what happened. The report is what Jesus did. It's it's what people need to believe, that he did what he said he would do. He died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose from the dead victorious over everything that he took to the grave or to the cross with him. And then Isaiah 54 says this is the result of him doing that. And we're going to go there and read a verse or two in a moment. But later today, sometime, you ought to read both of those chapters entirely. Okay, uh, so John chapter 12, uh, to make this clear for you, I'm just picking some verses uh, to help us. John chapter 12, verse 31 through 33. John 12, 31 through 33. 
This is Jesus talking. He's telling his disciples, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Now, if you leave that verse up there, verse 33 for, uh, 32, verse 32 for a second, he says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all peoples to myself. And if you, if you look in your Bible, I don't know if it shows, it doesn't show on these verses on the screen, but any Bible of that, that is close to an accurate translation will have peoples in brackets or italicized. What that means is uh, translators added the word peoples to try to help clarify what they thought was the revelation of this verse. And so I'll just, I'll just follow them for a second. Uh, Jesus did die for all of us, didn't he? Jesus didn't die for himself. He didn't need to. He was already righteous. He's already God. He already has everything. He, he, I mean, why would he come and die for us? Because he loves us. We're not his rescue project. We're the object of his love. And he rescued us because he loves us. So, it's true. When he died on the cross... It was as if we died with him. Paul says it in Romans chapter 6. We're buried in baptism in his death and we're raised to new life. That's why you want to be baptized. It's your symbol. It's your power. It's what you do after you put your faith and trust in Jesus. You go under the water in a burial of your own self and you raise into the life of Christ. You are buried with him. You identify with his death, and you raise up identifying with his resurrected life. It's the power of new covenant baptism, and so we're baptized in him. Yeah, it's right. If, if I'm going to the cross, which is what Jesus is talking about, I'm going to take everybody with me. So we, we, we can agree with the people who added the word peoples. But we can't agree if we put it in the structure of the sentences here because we have to look at see what the subject is. The subject isn't people. The subject is now the judgment of this world has come. So if, 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 if we read it in its original language and we look at the structure of the sentence and what the, what the subject is, it's judgment. So Jesus is, take the word people out of there now because it was just added by translators to help, try to help us. Uh, take that out of there, and then what is Jesus saying will be drawn to him when he goes to the cross? Now is the judgment of this world. When I go to the cross, all the judgment is going to be drawn to me. I'm going to the cross with all the judgment that is due mankind, all your failures, all your sins, everything that would judge you, everything that would come against you, everything that your sin would bring on you, it's going to come on me, and I'm going to take it to the cross. The judgment of this world has now come. You won't be judged anymore because I took your judgment. I took your pain. I took your sickness. I took your problem. It's Isaiah. 53, it's the report of the Lord. He took our burden. He took our judgment. If I go to that cross, everybody's judgment is coming on me. Oh, this is our message, folks. No wonder our feet are beautiful. We don't have to tell people God's going to get you because you're, you're, you got a problem. You, you better watch out. God's out to get you. He got Jesus. He loved us so much that whatever should get you got him. And it killed him. 
And because he was the spotless lamb of God, he rose victorious over it all so we could identify with him in baptism. And I'm not just talking about the symbol of baptism, but by burying ourselves in faith in Christ. He now gives us all of him because he took all our problem on the cross. He didn't leave anything undone. Read Isaiah 53. Our pain, our grief, our iniquity. Iniquity is the result of sin. The shame, the guilt, what should come on you, how you should be judged for your sin, all of it. Uh, He didn't leave any of it done. He said it right here in John 12. If I get lifted up on that cross, I'm telling you, everything that should come against you will be on me. (laughs) And then Paul comes along and says, how beautiful are the feet of somebody that preaches that gospel of reconciliation. And then in 2 Corinthians, the next verse we read, he said, don't you know God was reconciling people to himself in Christ and he's given to us the message of that reconciliation? (laughs) We got the best job on the planet. You say, well, yeah, you're a preacher. No, we all are. We got the best job. on. We're just, we're here. We might be a salesman. We might be a, a, a clerk. We might be a nurse. We might be a doctor. We might be a lawyer. We might be a farmer. We might be a carpenter. We, we, whatever we're doing, but we're really here to spread the message that God reconciled people to himself in Christ. You walk into work tomorrow, walk to wherever you're going, your feet are so beautiful because you're carrying the very heart of our God, the very heart of the Father to people to tell them God's not holding anything against you. Whatever was against you all went with Jesus. Come on. Everything. I'll draw all judgment. And then, so you just... Cross-reference that back to Isaiah 53. And it said, the Lord, God means God, laid on him the iniquity of us all. People sometimes, people sometimes almost mockingly uh, who want to refute Christianity will say things like, well, crucifixion isn't such a special death. Like, what's so special about crucifixion? meaning what was special for Jesus to be crucified because that that was their method of execution. People were crucified all the time. Why are you making such a big deal out of Jesus being crucified? That was just the method of execution, folks. No one has ever died like Jesus died because Jesus died not by the power of a cross, but under the weight of the whole world's sin. So nobody has ever died on a cross. No one has ever been tortured. No one has ever died the death he died. So when we talk about the crucified Lord, we're not just talking about the method. We're talking about why he died and what actually killed him. It was our iniquity. And it wasn't just mine. It was mine multiplied by billions of people. And he died. Having drawn every ounce of my iniquity and your iniquity to himself, he was infected with all people's problem. And it killed him. And we get to tell the story. Look at your feet. How beautiful are your feet. Beautiful. Look at your neighbor and tell him beautiful feet. Just (laughs) come on, beautiful feet. You're a messenger 
of peace. You're a messenger of peace. This covenant of peace. and See, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, uh, people would confess their sins over an animal or over a sacrifice. They'd lay their hands, transfer their sins to an animal. The animal would be killed. That's why you had sacrifices and all that. They would send a scapegoat away and all these rituals and things. They were all holy and amazing because they pointed to what Jesus was actually going to do for everybody. But in the new covenant, what Jesus came to do was that God was going to declare our sickness, our problem, our need, our sin over Him. God laid on Him. No human laid hands on Jesus and transferred our iniquity. God laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And that's why we come to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus looked into a cup because what you eat and drink, you can't drink poison and it not kill you because you can't separate yourself from what you drink and what you eat. It's what you take in, right? It's what we take in. So it was called the cup. And he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he looks into a cup, this, 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 this problem that he's going to become one with. And I don't know what he saw in that cup, what it might have physically looked like, because I don't think it was a physical cup, so I, I don't know if we could describe it. But he, he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I, whew, I, don't, I, don't, know if I, can, I don't know if I can drink this poison. It's, it's, I don't know if I can drink this poison because... We know from his words on the cross that the greatest agony was not his back torn to shreds, his beard completely pulled out, a crown of thorns on his head, blood flowing from every part of his body, so destro destroyed you, you couldn't tell it was him. You, you wouldn't have known if it was, you, you, Isaiah says you couldn't recognize him. He, he was destroyed physically. That, that's not what, that, that's not the agony, folks. That was just the result. What was his greatest agony? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, my greatest agony is me and God are separated. The poison separated us. But he drank that cup of poison and let it separate him from God so that the result could be our reconciliation. This story is beyond amazing, and we get to carry it. How beautiful are our feet. The messengers of peace. Okay, you, you, you want to hear the result? We're, al we're almost there. Can, can, can the kids handle this? Oh, sure, they're doing great. <laughs> okay. Uh, couple verses, and then we're going to take communion. Are, are you ready? Are you ready? Isaiah 54, verse 10. So th this is now the result of the report. What did it do? What, what happened when God forsook him because of all our iniquity on him? 
Can you, can you imagine eternally the Son of God has never, has never not been one with, with, with God? We, I, listen, our brains can't even. It, it, it makes my brain itchy just to think about this stuff. Eternally one never separated, perfection, holy, 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 never knows what it's like to be outside of pure light, outside of pure holy. He's God, folks. He's God. And he absorbs our problem, and suddenly eternal oneness is broken. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did that so that we can now say, my God, my God, you never leave me or forsake me. And that's our confidence. That's what it says in Hebrews. My God, my God, you never leave me or forsake me. You can never look at your problem and say, he, that's what separates me from God because he took your problem. The only thing that will separate you from God now is not accepting the finished work of Christ. That's why our message is, come. He reconciled himself to you. Now you reconcile yourself to him by faith in him. Isaiah 54.10. I, this stuff just messes me up. I, I have to be honest with you. I guess you can tell, right? It's like I want a megaphone. I want to tell the whole world. That this stuff is just so good. Isaiah 54 verse 10. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. Isaiah 53, he laid everything on him. Isaiah 54 now says, this is the covenant of peace. And he said, like the rainbow is to Noah, and that I'll never destroy the earth with a flood again, so I will never be angry with you again, because all my anger went on Jesus in Isaiah 53. Read it after today, later today. And look at it in that context. And verse 14, Isaiah 54, verse 14. In righteousness you shall be established. <laughs> Aren't you glad we're the righteousness of God? In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. You shall not fear and from terror, for it shall not come near you. This is our covenant of peace. And then here's a verse people quote for just practical everyday things, but it's in the context of this covenant of peace. In Isaiah 53, what's the verse? The last verse of Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. What weapons? Every tongue that rises against you in judgment. That's not your, your neighbor talking bad stuff about you. That's the enemy and your problem trying to accuse you before God. That tongue doesn't work anymore. That voice doesn't work anymore. It can't even get into court anymore because Jesus took our problem. Isaiah 53 has already been done. Now we're in the covenant of peace and there's not a tongue that can rise against you in judgment. Look, look what it says. Against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Here's a familiar verse. 1 John 4, verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. 
I'll make a bold statement because of Scripture. Couldn't make it on my own, but I can do it on the authority of Scripture. For God to judge you if you put your faith in Jesus, that's all. For God to judge you for your wrongs, he would have to judge his own son, Jesus. Because our righteousness is not our righteousness, it is his righteousness. For your righteousness is of the Lord, says the Lord. (laughs) Judgment, so what is judgment? Judgment is God's impulse of rejection toward anything that doesn't match his eternal perfection. That's why he's called holy, holy, holy. So anything that isn't absolutely perfect, three times perfect, holy, 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 God has an impulse of rejection against that. He has to have or he wouldn't be holy. If you don't hate wrong, you don't like good. It's just kind of that simple. It's like you say, well, I I love the good, but if you don't hate the wrong, then you don't really like the good. It just goes hand in hand. It's just natural. It's how it's how God is. He, he's holy, so anything that's not perfect, he has to reject. That's why to, to, to base on our holiness or our righteousness is just, is just stupidity. Because you can never, never measure up to his perfection. You'd better have his perfection, and he gives it to us as a gift. Gives it to us as a gift. Through Jesus. So, judgment, any thing that would cause God to have an impulse to reject because of his holiness. Jesus said, if I go up on that cross, all that impulse is coming to me. And it culminated in, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Until now, we are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He drank the cup. He went to the cross, having absorbed our condition. So that now through faith, we can absorb his condition. Glory, hallelujah. He took all our pain, all our iniquity, all our separation, all our iniquity. He gave us his perfection called his righteousness so that God's impulse toward us is now oneness and reconciliation. So God doesn't see you wake up in the morning and go, are they okay? Can I get close to them? God sees you wake up in the morning and goes, the apple of my eye. I have no zero impulse to reject them because all impulse to reject them was put on Jesus at the cross so that they in Christ now are reconciled to me and we can walk together. When all enmity is removed, now you can have fellowship or communion. And that's why communion is so beautiful. New covenant communion is us saying we believed and this is our symbol. This is our ordinance that says I've absorbed all of him. His righteousness. His favor. His relationship. His authority. His rights, His holiness, His healing, His strength, His life, 
His goodness. I looked in the cup, and all I saw in it is the kindness of God. I'm drinking that cup. It's the blood of the new covenant, the covenant of peace. close your eyes for a moment. Would you just worship, worship God in this moment?